preach. Corey says preach. Okay, let's look at, uh, in my book, it's page 124, and some of yours it might be a little ahead, a little before, but the heading is the Bible must be interpreted by the rule of the difference between interpretation and application. Difference between interpretation and application. And last week we looked at the uh, Bible must be interpreted by the rule of Hebrew parallelism. So, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, how wonderful it is, and help us to love it and to, to learn all we can about it and to obey it and to apply it to our lives, to live it, and pray that you would guide our Bible study tonight, help us to learn, and pray your Holy Spirit would teach us, that your Holy Spirit would guide me as I teach, preach, in Jesus' name, amen. So when we come to this category of Bible interpretation and application, you probably remember, uh, remember me telling this story because I've told it several times, but it has stuck with me through the years. It's 30, almost 32 years ago, I was... Um, working on the Pastor Bob Philbrick in his ministry. And I remember him telling me that a man in the church who was a uh, Bible professor, he had taught at a Bible college, and uh, the man thought he was, he had, he had arrived. Um, and he went to Pastor Philbrick and told Pastor Philbrick that he... His only responsibility as a preacher was to interpret the Bible, tell what the Bible says, and not to make any application. And you're being a busybody, and you're wrong, and it's offensive for you to be making applications and telling us that well, this man had a a Christian bookstore where he's selling Christian rock music, so-called so -called Christian rock music. He didn't want to hear that that wasn't right. Not that even that Pastor Philbert, uh, I'm sure he wasn't personally, you know, driving at him. But just the principle saying uh, you shouldn't go to the movies or you shouldn't dance or just principles, uh, holiness. Uh, it's wrong for you to make those kind of applications. And so, what's anybody supposed to do biblically? Biblically, what are you supposed to do? Is that right? You just, you just read the Bible and not make any application? So, can you give any Bible verses to refute that idea? Yes. Very good. Very good. Anybody else? Holly. All right. So you realize when you quote, quote that verse, when all scripts are given by inspiration of God and it's profitable, profitable and useful, uh, it's going to help. It's they were all Christians, we need God's word. It's profitable for doctrine. There's your, you got to interpret doctrine, teach what the Bible says. Do you know that the next things, reproof, that's application. That is application. Correction, that is application. Instruction, that is application. In righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto good works. That's applying again. That is applying God's word. That's application. So, wow. Here's one of the most well-known passages of Scripture concerning the word of God, and it is teaching us to apply God's word. 
Any other verses you can think of? Haley. Very good. Very good. So another one of our memory verses. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, that thou uh, meditate therein day and night. Very good. I see these faces like he, he's missing a part. Uh, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, but that thou may observe to do, that's application. And any time God's word says, do this, that's making an application. Anybody else? Yes. Very good. Doer of the word, not a hearer only. Any others? Very good. So reprove. That's application. What's a preacher supposed to do? Just read, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, and not say anything else about people's Corrupt communication, filthy communication, never explain what that means. Uh, uh, no, there's, there's explanation. There's given the sense of what it's saying and applying it. So reproof and rebuke and exhortation, those are all applying God's word not only to our own lives, but your children, you rebuke them, you repro reprove them, so you make an application. Think of any others. I mean, there's on and on. Yes. Very good. Very good. That's applying God's word. So you interpret it. It says go, and then you apply it. You go. And for a preacher to say, Go is applying it, it's also interpreting it, and it's all good and it's all right. And but somebody to say that, oh, you can't, you can't apply this, that doesn't even make sense. You remember, uh, I don't know if you remember my story, that this same man, when I asked him about rock music that he was selling in his store, he said, Unto the pure, all things are pure. And I said, so does that mean that um, it, for a Christian that, that is, he's pure, that uh, rape and murder uh, are right? Because to the pure, all things are pure. Didn't he make sense what he was saying? Is when the Bible says unto the pure, all things are pure, it's talking about if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and he's purified your heart and you... Um, then you have pure motives. Everything's going to be, you want pure motives to serve God. That's the way it should be. And he was misquoting that verse. So, interpretation, application, very important. And let's read down through what Brother Cloud has to say here. He says, interpretation refers to the basic meaning of a Bible passage gleaned according to the sound rules of interpretation. Application refers to applying a passage to daily living. It has been so, well, I get up, like, if we memorize, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the, the will of God abideth forever. Uh, if we memorize, uh, is it wrong for a preacher to stand up and say, you know, Hollywood is just the worldly attitude, and it supports the worldly lust. And all the music that comes out of Hollywood, the sensuality, the partying, the dancing, the uh, popular, the uh, constant desire for popularity and fame and riches, that's all the world. It's corrupt. 
Christians should not be involved in it. And, you know, shouldn't be involved in worldly parties and dances and rock music and, and all the rest. Is that wrong to make that application? It lines up with Bible principles. It definitely lines up with Bible principles. But what's happening so many times today, and because uh, this man was 32 years ago, saying that, no, you're going too far. Well, what are you supposed to do? Say nothing? Like, man, you got to apply God's word. Be a doer of God's word. So, um, back to our um, book here. It says, it has been said that there is one interpretation and many applications. That is true, except for those cases in which the meaning of a passage is ambiguous enough to allow for more than one interpretation. That there, we went, remember I skipped ahead? I don't know if you'd remember this because this was months ago. I skipped ahead. Uh, to Brother Cloud makes a point that, and the next point he makes in, in number 17 in interpreting the Bible, he says the Bible must be interpreted by the rule that multiple interpretations can be correct. And what I was taught at Bible college is there's really only one correct interpretation, though we may not sometimes be sure we have it. Uh, it. It will be like, well, this might be true. This might, uh, oh, I can't. Um, and sometimes you're reading a commentary to find out what does that passage of Scripture mean? And they might go, well, this is what some think. And, well, one of those is right. And when we get to heaven, we'll know which one is right. Um, but Real, you you uh, need to think that there's this one right interpretation, and I want that right interpretation. But in things, especially eschatology, eschatology means things of the future, future events that are coming, and the rapture, and the millennium, and eternity, and heaven, and uh, sometimes that you're reading. Uh, a covenant theologian like Matthew Henry, Matthew Paul, they might put things in. You say, well, um, you may say they're right, but not exactly in the right. They kind of, like, if they're in the same general meaning, you could say, well, yeah, they're right, but they're not specific on that. And you might say, okay, that's a different. It, it, they're right because it's in the future. But anyway, but we just want to be as right as we can be. All to say that. And also to say that we're never going to be. Uh, we're just imperfect people trying our best to follow the Lord. And uh, Lord Jesus, please help us because uh, we need help. But... Um, all to say that he says some passages are ambiguous enough to allow for more than one interpretation. Just be careful about that. Back to it. One of the errors commonly committed by Bible students, including teachers and preachers, is to focus on the application of a passage without having first understood the emphasis and the basis interpretation or meaning. Many Bible study groups ask the question, what does this, you ever been in a Bible study, that, what does this verse or passage mean to you? And it's kind of like, ooh, what's it? Kind of just like, nobody really, it's just whatever it means to you. Well, that's not the way you interpret the Bible. First of all, you say, this is what God is saying. Like, honor thy father and thy mother. What is God saying there? He is saying, honor thy father and thy mother. And if we say, what does it mean to you? Well, I think it means that, uh, well, uh, it ought to, what it ought to mean to you is honor thy father and thy mother. And 
sometimes and it's, it's uh, we think we're being spiritual by you know, oh what does this when really what we need to do is get the right interpretation of what God is saying and then apply it to our lives and these uh, um, you know sometimes well I think uh, Paul warns Paul warns about being given to uh, questions and stripes of word words where you just want to debate everything the Bible says and question everything the Bible says and you get uh, you know Bible studies are great uh, but sometimes you'll get somebody that questions the the Bible questions the pastor questions this and that and whatever they just live like they can never zero in on this is what the Bible says and so they want let's have a Bible study so we can just talk about what the Bible says and we'll have it we'll have it on Thursday because you know what I gotta get uh, I gotta get some Bible in I can't make church on Sundays and so we'll have it on Thursday uh, you know what the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Stop this wishy-washy discussing and questioning and zero in on what does the Bible say. And we'd be a lot better off. But that's where the age we live in. Let's just get together and talk about the Bible instead of let's uh, obey the Bible and do what the Bible says and rightly interpret the Bible. So... What does this verse mean to you? Uh, that's the wrong question to start off with. The first question is, what does this verse or passage mean in its context according to sound principles of Bible study? That's the way we're supposed to approach it. When handling a passage of scripture, the student must first determine the interpretation only after the basic interpretation is clear and only after it is explained can the application be drawn from it. A Sunday school song says, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, all the blessings of his love divine, every promise in the book is mine. But this isn't true. Well, what Brother Cloud is just getting us all thinking what he is saying is, is that there are Bible passages that find their fulfillment in the Jews, or that found their fulfillment in Abraham or David, um, and we've got to know that, and we've got to recognize that uh, and interpret it right. I would say that we know that, uh, and Brother Cloud is... Like he's getting us thinking that interpretation, right interpretation comes first. Because if you're like me, you're saying, well, every promise is mine. But, like we said, there's, there's things that uh, will be fulfilled for Israel. And because I, being a believer, uh, am a, you might say, a true Jew, I'm going to get the benefits. I'm going to get the side benefits. I'll get the side benefits of it all. But there's things that are true for the Jews and things that are true for the church, and we've got to interpret and make distinctions. So uh, he says, the promise of uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is not mine. It is Abraham's. The promise of Genesis 28, 13 is not mine. It's Jacob's. The promise of 2 Samuel 7, 18 is not mine. It's David's. Well, foremost, the promises to Abraham, I'm going to bless your seed. But I think we would all say that we still were, in, were blessed in the seed of the Lord. The seed, singular, Galatians tells us, is the Lord Jesus. We are blessed in the Lord Jesus. Uh, recently, he says, during a testimony time in prayer meeting, a woman said she had gotten a blessing from 2 Samuel 7, 28 through 29 that day. I wondered if she understood 
that this promise pertained first and foremost to David. Uh, the promise of Deuteronomy 30, turn to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, in verse 3, it says that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Well, clearly that's talking about Israel. It says, if any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee from thence will he fetch thee, uh, the Christian can make an application that the Lord watches over his children and the Lord will take care of me. But the even greater application is because I'm, uh, um, I'm just little old me. God has a great big giant plan that he is going to fight. He's going to come and fight for Israel, and he's going to set his kingdom up. He is going to be king of kings and reign from Jerusalem. And that's the, that's what it's driving at here. Uh, the Lord's going to take care of uh, Israel. The Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So the interpretation is God's talking about his nation Israel. Application is we can say God takes care of his children, watches over his children. And so uh, he says, consider Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon Song of Solomon, what's he say? He says, I once heard a message on this passage. Instead of beginning uh, by explaining that the interpretation and first meaning of this song is about the love of a man and woman, which is very clear from the literal meaning of the words. Is that true? Is that right? Song of Solomon? About the love of man the, um, the man for his bride and the bride for her groom? Well, if you read through it, yes. But I've actually had, um, I know at least one preacher that said to me, uh, I think that it's just a, uh, an allegory, spiritual. It's not talking about, the, the main meaning is not about husband and wife. It is, you know, picture in the church, in the Lord. Well, no. Read it. Take it for what it is. The church didn't even exist. It was written in the Old Testament. And if you take Solomon's writings, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs is for parenting. The father that's writing Proverbs, he keeps saying, my son, listen to this. My son, listen to this. My son, be a hard worker. Do this. My son, uh, watch out for a strange woman that's going to lead you astray. My son, my Proverbs is for parents. Song of Solomon is for husband and wife and encouraging that romance within the marriage. And then Ecclesiastes is all about life in general and that it is vain. It is vanity of vanities without the Lord. So it forms, Solomon's writings form this beautiful trilogy that Ecclesiastes helps you nail down what life is all about. It's about serving God, keeping his commandments. Proverbs shows you everything you should be teaching your kids. And there's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, so many things in Proverbs about uh, what your children should be doing to build character in them. And then Song, uh, Song of Solomon, encouraging a wonderful marriage relationship. But I like that Brother Cloud used this as an illustration because I preached on Song of Solomon one time, and a preacher told me, no, I don't believe that. Well, 
read it some more. Read it some more because you're, he would be making his application the interpretation. Don't make your application. When you say, well, the, the, uh, this is spiritually teaching this. Well, then you're flipping things. You're putting the cart before the horse because you're making your application your interpretation. No, you make your interpretation. This is talking about love between husband and wife. Then you can make an application that this also pictures the beautiful, beautiful love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his bride, the church. It illustrates it. It pictures it. But that's not the main interpretation. So, um, Brother Cloud explains that there. And he said, uh, at best, that this is an application to support his teaching that the believers should kiss Christ the preacher used Psalm 2.14, but again, he pulled this from his context and made the application into the interpretation. Psalm 2.14 refers to submission to Christ as Lord and coming kings. That is the interpretation according to the clear context. Only very secondary, secondarily is, that, is there an application to the believer's intimate relationship with Christ. And he goes down through, says, consider Psalm 63, a dry and thirsty land. Well, literally, that's referring to the Judean wilderness. And then you could, that's the proper interpretation. Then you apply it to, man, you can apply that to the world today. It is a dry and thirsty land. And then he mentions uh, Genesis 15.1. The subject is... A not fear not, it's fear not Abraham. Make sure that you understand that those promises that Abraham were to be literally fulfilled. And uh, then he mentions, consider 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is spoken to Israel. And we looked at this probably a year ago, that the context is the dedication of Solomon's temple. And Israel was to be faithful to God's house, and to turn to God's house and go to God's house to pray about everything they faced. And it says their land is the land of Israel. New Testament believers can make a general application of this. Anytime God's people will humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, God will bless them. But we cannot say that God will bring healing to a Gentile nation I mean, God only promises in his word to heal Israel. Isn't that amazing? And, you know, we love the United States of America. It has been blessed with freedoms like, like never before. But think of through the centuries, and you can even go back before the Lord uh, through the centuries of the hundreds of Hundreds of nations that have risen and fallen, risen and fallen. And God says, Israel's going to rise and never fall again. I'm going to reign from Israel as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so um, we know, we know that God, and historically God has blessed the United States of America. Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, and wonderful... Uh, times in our country, but to say that you can say, you can pick this passage and say, God's going to revive America. It's nowhere in the book of Revelation, which tells us about the end times. And, but we believe and we know that God can uh, refresh and renew his church, his people, um, and we can walk with him until he calls us all home. Um, but he ends with this illustration. He says, when it comes to application, the Bible student and the teacher must be careful that it is legitimate. It must conform to the truth of God's word. I read of a preacher who applied the fall of Jericho's walls to a male Bible college student as falls. If you want a girl to be your wife, Walk around her seven times, and her heart will fall for you, and she will marry you. No, 
she will say, you're crazy. Get, get away from me. What are you doing? And that's not proper application. That is contrary to the teaching of the Bible. So first you make a proper interpretation. Then you make your application. So we will stop right there.